long in the, the sermon series, but it's amazing how it perfectly flows into what we're, we're talking about today. Let's start with where we left off last week, Exodus chapter 4, verse 29. To read and review, it said, Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the Israelites. Aaron repeated everything the Lord had said to Moses and performed the signs before the people. The people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had paid attention to them and that he had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Where we left the story off last week, the Israelites were in a great place. They were starting to, be, they were starting to believe. They were excited. What we're going to talk about this week is what happens when you start to make a good change. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I simply ask that you hide me behind your cross this morning, that your word might shine through, that your grace and your light might shine through, that we all might be challenged and changed, that we all might grow into the image of your Son. I ask in Jesus' great name, amen. So where we left off last week, Moses had just been called by God to go and deliver the Israelites. And God had told him everything to do. And Moses came up with excuse after excuse not to. But the Lord sent him anyways. And he went anyways. And immediately we saw the Israelites heard what he had to say. And they listened. And they were excited. And they were so excited that they bowed down and they worshipped. But so shortly after that, let's look. It says in chapter 5, Later, Moses and Aaron went in and said to Pharaoh, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. Moses is, you know, he's, he's riding on a, a Holy Spirit high, so to speak. He's excited. Things are going well. And he goes into Pharaoh, feels and he says, Yahweh says, let the people go so they can hold a festival. But Pharaoh responded, who is Yahweh that I should obey him by letting Israel go? I don't know anything about Yahweh. And besides... I will not let Israel go. So Pharaoh denies the request and he sort of mocks God in the process. So then they answered once again. They said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go on a three-day trip into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God or else he may strike us with plague or sword. The king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you causing the people to neglect their work? Get to your work. Pharaoh also said, look, the people of the land are so numerous and you would stop them from working. So he says, I'm not going to grant that request. You're just saying that because you're lazy. That's the only reason you want to do that. It's because you're lazy. That day, Pharaoh commanded the overseers of the people as well as their foremen, don't continue to supply the people with straw for making bricks. As before, they must go and gather straw for themselves, but require the same quota of bricks from them as they were making, from, as they were making before. Do not reduce it, for they are slackers. That's why they're crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Impose heavier work on the men. Then they will be occupied with it and not pay attention to deceptive words. When you first start to make a change in your life, when God calls you out and you answer the call and you say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you, you will find, and you already have found, I'm sure, that for a short while, it's easy. Right? You're excited, hey, God has changed my life and I'm ready to follow him and I'm, you know, I'm ready to go after it. But then, but then, without fail, difficulty comes in. And it's like we're surprised by it at times, but, but of course it does. It doesn't even just have to be in the faith. Anything good that you try to do, without fail, adversity is going to come along with it, right? And so the Israelites, they were excited. They said, God has heard us and he's coming to deliver us. But Pharaoh's response was, nope, I'm going to make your work harder so that you will not pay attention to what he called deceptive words. You'll find that happen in your spiritual life. Try to get in the Bible more. Try to spend more time reading the Bible. You'll figure out very quickly how many things just all of a sudden pop up. How much more work there is to do that will keep you from getting into the Word. These things are spiritual, and as I mentioned, they're holy. But, but Paul would say about himself, I am, holy, sold as a, I am unholy, sold as a slave unto sin. 
When the unholy, which was us, tries to start being holy, there are lots of obstacles that will come in the way. And it's been said, if the devil can't make you bad, he will make you busy. So Pharaoh immediately, because they're crying out and they want freedom, he says, no, let's make them work harder so they can't even pay attention to what this guy has to say to them. And that's what the enemy will try to do to you as you try to grow in the faith. You've probably experienced that. I think every single one of us, if you tried to follow God at all, you found how difficult it can be. C.S. Lewis once said that, that Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and scarcely tried. If you are trying to make things better in your life, if you're trying to get freedom, it often, in fact, almost always, will start by things becoming a little bit harder, a little bit more difficult, right? What what growth does not go through difficulty? So the overseers and the foremen of the people went out and said to them, this is what Pharaoh says, I am not giving you straw. Go get straw yourselves wherever you can find it. But there will be no reduction at all in your workload. So the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The overseers insisted, finish your assigned work each day, just as you did when straw was provided. And of course, because now they had more work to do in the same amount of time, they didn't do as good of a job. Then the Israelites' foremen, whom Pharaoh's slave drivers had set over the people, were beaten and asked, Why haven't you finished making your prescribed number of bricks yesterday or today, as you did before? So he gave them an impossible task to do, and then when they couldn't do it, he punished them for it. So the Israelite foremen went in and cried to help for Pharaoh. Why are you treating your servants this way? No straw has been given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks. Look, your servants are being beaten, but it is your own people who are at fault. Let's understand, something very important has to happen with the Israelites. Because, guys, you've read the entire book of Exodus before, probably. You know how this story goes. We teach it to our children very early on in life. You know that they eventually do leave Egypt, and they eventually do make it into the promised land. But what we have to understand is, they had to be made ready For the promised land. Faith is not something that you are just born with. It is something that is built and is developed. Amen? Okay? We make the mistake sometimes of thinking that it's just like, okay, I believe and now it's going to be easy to believe forever. No! There are always going to be obstacles that come in the way. The Israelites originally believed Moses and Aaron and it said they worshipped. But when problems came up, Who did they go to first? They went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was their authority at the time. That was their leader that they were trusting to take care of them in their time of slavery. And so they first bring their suffering to Pharaoh. They protest him and say, hey, it's not our fault. We're working as hard as we can and we can't get it done. But Pharaoh's response says, but he said, you are slackers, slackers. That is why you're saying, let us go sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. No straw will be given to you, but you must produce the same quantity of bricks. I mentioned last week that things have to get bad enough for people to be willing to make a change. Things were already very bad. They were having to throw their sons into the river to their death when their sons were being born. But now things were getting even worse. Now their work was being made harder and harder. And all they were hearing is, you guys are just slackers. Get back to work. Sorry, I'm hitting my microphone. I'm getting too excited here. Pharaoh just called them lazy, but look at their next response. The Israelite foremen saw that they were in trouble when they were told, you cannot reduce your daily quota of bricks. When they left Pharaoh, they confronted Moses and Aaron, who stood waiting to meet them. May the Lord take note of you and judge, they said to them, because you have made us reek in front of Pharaoh and his officials, putting a sword in their hand to kill us. So the same Israelites who had just been worshiping and excited that God was going to deliver them, are now frustrated with Moses and Aaron and want them to basically leave them alone because adversity came up. Nothing good happens without going through adversity to get there, right? My generation, you know, what what do they say about millennials? I'm a millennial. What's our generation? They say that we're lazy, we're entitled, all that stuff, right? I never realized growing up as a kid how much hard work was required for success, 
Honestly, school came easily to me. And then when I got out of school and started to enter the real world, I, I crumbled, basically. And thankfully, that's when the Lord called out to me. But I didn't realize how much daily effort was required to actually do what you're supposed to do. When I got saved, I expected, you know, yeah, God's just going to show me everything and teach me. And he does. But, but do you think God just digitally downloads everything into your brain? No. How do you learn more about God? you got to study this book, and is that easy? No, it's challenging. It's incredibly challenging at times. And, and oftentimes, and I, I, I don't want to guilt anyone about this, but I think our natural response can be, we start to read this and say, man, this is confusing. We close it and we put it aside because it's tough, right? Of course there's adversity. Of course there's difficulty anytime you try to make a change. But the problem is we're surprised by it when it happens. So they became angry at Moses and Aaron because these people who said they were going to deliver him had just made their life harder to begin with. But then look at what Moses and Aaron do. So Moses went back to the Lord and asked, Lord, why have you caused trouble for this people? And why did you ever send me? Ever since I went into Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has caused trouble for this people, and you haven't delivered your people at all. So Moses passes the blame along to God. Now let me ask you, did this change God's plan? We're going to read God's response to this shortly, but, but as I said, you've read the story before. Do you think that God is held back by our adversity? Did God not know that this was going to happen when he sent Moses and Aaron? Of course he did. Did God immediately say, oh, you have disbelieved and kick Moses and Aaron out and give up on the Israelites? No, because faith is something that is built. It is something that is developed and it is something that grows. So is obedience. Obedience is something that is built. This faith, while an instant thing where you believe in Jesus, is also something that grows over the course of time. I think one of the great errors, and it's, it's an error of perception of the way we see things, is when a new person comes into the church, they just think that they have to have it all figured out all of a sudden. Of course not. And sometimes I think we can sort of, you know, as people who've been in the church a while, can have that expectation that, hey, these people, they, they know all this stuff already. Of course they don't, you know. We have to learn and we have to grow together, but you better believe that every step that we take of growth is going to be met with resistance. It's only natural. But look at God's response. But the Lord replied to Moses, Now you are going to see what I will do to Pharaoh. He will let them go because of my strong hand. He will drive them out of, this, of his land because of my strong hand. God's plan hasn't changed. It was all part of God's plan all along. But what you have to realize, for the Israelites to be ready to take the promised land, they had to go through this. You have to go through difficulty to grow. The book of James says, Blessed are you when you face trials of many kinds. Rejoice when this happens. For, for trials develop perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so it will be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Uh, we've been talking a lot about marriage in early service uh, the past few weeks. And there was a man, uh, uh, his name was Martin, at a church that I went to uh, eight years ago now. And he, he passed away. He's since gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, but I got a chance to get to know him very well because my pastor at the time assigned me to drive Martin over to Quincy, Illinois from Kirksville. So we had a few hours in a vehicle together because he had doctor's appointments because he was uh, suffering with cancer. And we got to talk a lot on that trip. And there was a couple in our church who said they never fought. Ever, ever. They agreed when they got married they were never going to fight. And he brought that up. He said, said you know, they... They say they don't fight very much, or they, they refuse to fight. And he said, boy, they sure miss out on a lot of good making up. <laughs> Guys, if you want something to grow, it often requires you to fight for it to grow, doesn't it? If you want, to, so, so my, you know, if there are any muscle heads out there, if you want to build your physical strength, the way you actually do that scientifically, when you lift weights, you are breaking down your muscles so that they will then come back stronger. That's the way the body is designed to work. 
When you get your vaccines, they are giving you a small, very weak version of the problem so that your body will build the defenses to fight against that problem. So if the big problem comes in, you're ready for it. It's training. That's what all this is. And the same thing happens in faith. So when you begin to believe and you begin to trust God and begin to follow after him, there are going to come trials. The trials are not meant to destroy you. Notice the Israelites originally went to Pharaoh to try to fix their problems, and Pharaoh didn't fix their problems. They got angry at God, but they'll get over that anger and eventually turn to him, right? And they have to continue, and they're going to go through struggle after struggle after struggle because God will say about them, they're very stubborn, but eventually they take the promised land, the Israelites do. He brings them through that. What does the name Israel mean? Do you guys remember? When Jacob's name was changed to Israel? Yeah, has wrestled or struggled with God and with men and prevailed or survived. Their name literally means they have struggled, they have wrestled with God and with men and they are here still. And their name continues to be that testimony to this day. Benjamin Netanyahu, their prime minister, at least for the time being, he had addressed the United Nations uh, a few years back and he mentioned, you know, all these empires that have tried to destroy them. He said, you know, is, is basically, is the empire of Rome still here? You know, are, is Nazi Germany still in power? And he says, yet we are still here through all of this. And that name is proven true, but they have to be brought there. They're not the reason they're still there. God is the reason they're still there, but they had to go through difficulty to be refined. We have to go through difficulty to be refined. But God hasn't changed his message. He still says, I'm going to deliver them. You're going to see it. How does God build your faith? I said through trials, but, but how through trials? Is it not when he brings you through it? When you get to the other side? Now, I've got to tell you, uh, I hate driving in the rain, in, in the dark. Okay, driving through a storm is terrifying to me. I just can't see all that well, and I just, I don't like it. We got to drive home from uh, Lonnie and Kay's the other night when the rain was coming down and there was some water on the road and it was scary. But when you drive through a storm, you often don't see everything when you're going through it. But when you get on the other side and you can look at it, you can say, oh, we made it. We got through. We grew. In any sort of fight, you get through it and you reconcile afterwards and you say, we made it through that. We're stronger now. That's the purpose of trials. They are to make you stronger and not to destroy you. So we continue on. Because God doesn't just say, you're going to see what I'm going to do. He, he has to remind him of a couple more things. Then God spoke to Moses telling him, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. He starts by reminding Moses exactly who he is and what he has already done. If you are struggling with something today, go back and look at what God has already done in other people's struggles. That's what we're doing right here. Because we can learn from their struggles how to deal with our struggles. He says, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land they live in as foreigners. He reminds Moses what he has done. So he's told him who he is and what he has done. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are forcing to work as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. He says, I've heard their struggling. I already know about their struggling. That's why I called you to begin with. Therefore... Tell the Israelites, I am Yahweh, and I will deliver you from the forced slavery of the Egyptians and free you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm in great acts of judgment. He doesn't say I might or I can. He says I will. He's saying I am going to do this. Tell them so that they know. And he goes further. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. You will know that I am Yahweh, your God, who delivered you from the forced labor of the Egyptians says, this is going to happen. Let them know that this is going to happen. I will bring you to the land that I swore you to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am Yahweh. He says, this is what is going to happen. Why is he telling him so plainly? Because this is how he's going to build their faith. He says, yeah, you're not going to necessarily believe or, or be so excited about right now, but when you see this, you will know that I am who I say I am and that I am the one who is telling you this. But then Moses told this to the Israelites. 
But they did not listen to him because of their broken spirit and hard labor. Church, I'm sorry to say it, but this is where far too many of us find ourselves in life life at times. We can read the word of God and we can see what he says and we can hear the promises and we can say, yeah, and we doubt, right? Does that ever happen to you? It's easy to believe when you're on the mountaintop, but then when you start going through the struggles, it becomes a little bit harder. It was easy for the Israelites to believe at first, but then when their work all of a sudden became hard, it broke their spirit. That's what the enemy wants to do to you. If you want to grow in the faith, you're going to find all sorts of... The parable of the sower. I preached on it twice, actually. Once before I was your pastor, and then the, my first sermon here was on the parable of the sower. There, there were four different situations that the seed was planted. The first one, the birds come and snatch it away right away. The second one, it doesn't take much root, and so then it grows too quickly and it dies off because there's no root. The third one, thorns choke it out. The thorns are what I'm talking about here, where you got the trials of this life and different troubles that can keep your eyes off of Christ if you let it. Your struggles will either make you or break you. It's how you choose to respond to him, honestly, most of the time, is, is what they will do to you. If you choose to doubt and, oh, woe is me, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I'll go eat worms, yeah, you're not going to grow much. But if you say, yes, this is difficult, but I trust you, God, that you're going to bring me through it. Yes, I don't know what to do yet, but I'm going to trust you, God, that you are going to give me what to do. Watch what happens. Try him in this. If you trust him and continue to be faithful to him, he will bring you through. But the Israelites weren't ready to hear that yet. But did this deter God? Did this stop God from doing what he wanted to do? No. So they didn't listen. So then the Lord spoke to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go from his, hand, from his land. Go tell, you know, yeah, they didn't listen. Go tell Pharaoh again. But Moses said in the Lord's presence, if the Israelites won't listen to me, then how will Pharaoh listen to me? Since I am such a poor speaker. Huh. He had that doubt in a couple chapters ago. But the first time he went to speak to Pharaoh, that doubt had all of a sudden gone away, right? When adversity comes up, those doubts, those insecurities, all of a sudden start to creep their way back in, don't they? You can move past a lot of your own weaknesses at times when things are going well, but but then it's, oh God, I don't know about that. But who, who called Moses? God did. And when Moses originally used that excuse, what was God's response? I'm the one who's sending you. Don't I? Am I not the one who gives you the mouth to speak and ears to hear and all of that? God will take our focus from our abilities when we're in trials to his abilities. Is God limited by anything? No. It says God's weakness is stronger than man's strength and God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom. He is high above the earth. He is so holy. And that's why I want to talk about holiness over the course of this month. Because when you understand just how good, just how holy and how high and lifted up God is, your own inadequacy seems very small. He can use anyone. He literally used a donkey to rebuke a man. He can use anyone who is willing to follow him and put their faith in him. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them commands concerning both the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. What's one thing you can notice about God in this? Is God persistent? Are you thankful that God is persistent? I am incredibly thankful that God is persistent because I, like the Israelites, am very stubborn sometimes. It takes me a while to learn stuff. And I am very glad that God did not just give up on me, even though that's what I deserved. But he stayed after me, and he continued, and he continued. And when I mess up, he says, yeah, you messed up, but that's okay. Here, let's fix it. Let's learn how to not do it again. And he continues to do that over and over and over again. That's sanctification. That's the process of being made holy. 
That's what he wants to do for each and every one of us. But it's difficult. It's challenging, but it's worth it. And so after, oh, that's where we're going to stop the story actually this week. Sorry, I'm getting, getting ahead of myself. You're going to see what happens, but notice that God will not relent in this. Moses tries to come up with every excuse. The Israelites try to come up with every excuse, but he says, no, this is going to happen. I am going to bring you out of here. You don't see it yet, but I'm going to do it. Don't think that the struggles that you immediately face when you're trying to come out are stopping you from actually coming out. The Israelites had to be made ready to leave, and they had to be made ready to enter the promised land. How can you tell about some of this? Well, when you look at when they were in the wilderness, what do they want to do at times? Go back to Egypt. And God gets really frustrated about that because they are slaves, their labor is hard, they literally have to kill their own children, and they would want to go back to that after he delivers them out? They have to see just how bad Egypt is to be willing to go in the first place because, guys, i got to tell you, and, and I, am, I am terrible about this still, and this is something I'm still trying to grow from, we worship comfort sometimes more than we worship God. I hate to say it, but we are creatures of routine, and routine's not bad, but routine can become a tomb to us. I sit at the same place every Sunday morning. Well, see, that's not bad, but it's just we're such creatures of routine. But if our routine, if, if that comfort becomes what we worship, then we can reject God at times. That's what the Israelites were doing. Yes, they were, they were miserable, but, oh man, the road to freedom is, is more difficult. Ah, we'd rather just keep being slaves. We'd rather just stay in it. That's what a lot of people do with Christianity, and I hate that for us. But any time you try to accomplish something of value, something good, there are going to be obstacles that come in the way. At the end of chapter 4, the Israelites were worshiping. They were excited because they believed that he was going to deliver them. But by the end of chapter 6, the Israelites wanted Moses and Aaron to leave them alone because their lives had only become more difficult. The road to freedom is always, always, always paved with difficulty. Things often get a little bit worse immediately when you're trying to make them better in the long run, don't they? Like I said, uh, I think it was in the late service I mentioned this on construction projects. There's, no, it was early service. There's no such thing as an easy project around the house for me at times. Although, God disproved that already. I was able to install some curtains and everything went according to plan. It was amazing. Glory to God. Um, that's a rarity. But the struggles early on, so we're new homeowners, we've never owned a house before, the difficulty early on of trying to improve the house improves what the house looks like the entirety of the time we're there. But it can be frustrating and challenging in the early going, and it can be easy to just be like, nope, I'm giving up, I, house is going to stay as it is, sorry. But love propels us to keep moving forward, right? That's why God blessed me with a good wife, because <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't have curtains if it was just my house, there's no way. I wouldn't want to go through the difficulty to get the reward of, you know, a house that looks presentable. Everything good you want to do, almost always, it's tough at the beginning. Right? Anybody learn to play? You know, we have some wonderful piano players here. I took piano lessons when I was a kid and I gave up because I was frustrated. Because it got difficult. I play the piano some now, as, as you guys know, but we, Kelsey and I were talking yesterday about goals, you know, just went through these questions of like, what's something you would have done differently? I would not have given up on piano lessons because I would be so much better now than I was then if I was willing to go through the difficulty to get there. And that's a simple earthly thing. But with the heavenly things, it's the same way. Guys, we have one life to live on this earth. It is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. You have a limited amount of time on this earth and you have a choice. Am I willing to go through whatever difficulty it takes to know God and to know what he wants and to follow him or would I rather just be comfortable and eh, no, come what may. Every single one of us has that choice. You're going to doubt at times. You're going to struggle at times. Don't don't feel guilty because the doubt comes up. Don't feel guilty because you're struggling. 
Struggling is not sin. Struggling implies that you're continuing to go even though there's difficulty. Sometimes we can feel guilty if we even start to feel doubt. When it becomes something of guilt is when you dwell on it and you continue in it. Do you guys ever have doubts? What do you do with your doubts? Take them to God. God will answer them. You can't control the doubt popping up. You can control what you do with it. This is sanctification. Faith is something that is built. But what do you think that Moses is going to do in the midst of his doubts and his fears? Is he just going to run away back to Midian? No. He's going to keep going because God is building his faith. But Moses at the very end of Deuteronomy is a completely different man than Moses at the beginning of Exodus, isn't he? We'll find that. We'll see that as we go. He's completely changed. But the only way he could have changed was by the difficulty that laid in front of him. So I'll quote it one more time. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. This verse is stuck out to me. This passage is stuck out to me over the years because I was a millennial. I was the, the chief millennial where I was completely lazy, completely entitled. I thought the world owed me everything. And then when I started to face trials as I was learning how to, you know, take care of myself, this verse continued to stick out to me. I went into a decent amount of debt for student loans for college, and I didn't realize what that meant. I wanted, man, when I got saved, I was like, God, I wish you'd just forgive all this debt right away and it'd be gone. God taught me, nope, it's not going to work that way. I'm going to bring you out little by little. You're going to work hard and you're going to be able to pay and pay and pay. And I've been able to do that because of the blessings of God. But it has been this played out. Consider it a great joy, my brothers, when you experience various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Guys, I am a head pastor now. That is a weird position for someone in my age to be. Right? Maybe not. Okay. I think it's, you know, I, I sometimes look and I'm like, Cody, you're 29 years old and you're the pastor of church. That's sort of weird. Everybody asks me when they see me in public, so are you the youth pastor? Well, No. But I can realize the reason that I am here today, the reason that God has prepared me is because of difficulties I went through when I was a youth pastor, difficulties I went through when I was a worship leader, difficulties I went through when I was a board member at a church. I got to see all of those things from the inside and the challenges of those. And because I was willing to go through those and continue and persevere and persevere, God saw fit to bless me with this position that I might try to teach you guys and help you to do the same thing. To persevere in the midst of difficulties. That's the reason I'm here. But guess what? You know, there's, there's a honeymoon phase of marriage, right? There's a honeymoon phase of the church, too. I've been here six months now. Some of the honeymoon stuff, you know, we're starting to get to reality, and that's a good thing. I'm starting to learn, like, okay, here's what we need to do. And some of these things that I'm seeing that we need to do, it's like, oh, buddy, that might be a little bit tough. There might be some struggles. And my flesh wants to say, well, let's just avoid that and make everybody happy all the time. That'd be the easy thing to do, right? But church, we've got to be free. We've got to have the freedom that God has given us. We have to grow in that freedom. And the only way to do that is going to mean going through tough stuff. That's why I'm preaching on marriage in early service. Guys, that's a terrifying topic to preach on because it's a sensitive subject for people. That's why I preach on well, you'll, you'll hear more and more as we go on, but we have to go through the tough stuff. We can't avoid the tough stuff because the tough stuff is how we actually grow. But when it says consider it a great joy, what does that mean? If James is telling us to do that, that means we have a choice. We all have a decision and I can't make that decision for anyone but myself. When trials come up, you have a decision to make. You can either say, woe is me. You can say, God must hate me because I'm facing a trial. You can try to say, the devil is trying to get me. Or you can consider it joy. It sounds completely counterintuitive, but many times in life now, I love facing new challenges. There are some I don't look forward to. And there are some, you know, i got to apply this to my own life. But there are many times now when it's something new is coming up and I know it's going to be difficult and it's scary. It's, yeah, let's go. I can't tell you how excited I was for Kennedy and Dylan's wedding. That was my first uh, wedding to perform. 
I was excited. I was about jumping. They were excited, but I might have been on that day itself when we were getting ready to walk out there. I might have been more excited than them because Dylan especially is very scared to be in front of people. Um, but I was excited. I was ready. Like, let's go. Let's do this because it's like I have a chance to grow today. Do you want to grow, church? I don't even just mean in numbers. Guys, we got weather today. We usually have a lot more people than we have here today, but I'm not worried about that. I mean, do you want to grow spiritually? If you want to grow spiritually, it's going to come through difficulty. What's the old saying? Never pray for patience because the only way to teach you patience is through struggles. Guys, pray for patience. Ask for it. Pray for love. Pray for joy. Pray for peace. Because these things will benefit you in all areas of life. But guys, they don't come easily. If they did, every single person would have them. They come through difficulty. They come through spending time on your face before God in prayer. They come through reading the Bible even when it doesn't make sense. They come through when God says, hey, do this. And you're like, oh, well, that's scary and I don't want to. They come, it comes through, yes, I'm going to do that. doesn't mean you're not scared anymore. It's, yes, I'm going to do that even though I'm afraid, even though it's difficult. But that's a choice for each and every one of you. For each and every one of us. We all have that choice. Can you just make that choice one time? Unfortunately, no. Here's the last problem of this. Just applying this to our lives. It can be easy at times to make a decision during a church service. Right? Hey, when, when the word of God's going and you can feel the Holy Spirit moving and say, yes, I know exactly what I need to do. Right? But then we leave the church. And then Monday hits. And we're back to the real world. Like I said, we leave, we, in a sense, we leave the real world to enter into a holy place that is set apart, set apart to God here. You can see things so much more clearly in a church service than you can sometimes when you're working your nine to five, right? What happens when you make a decision now, when you believe, when you agree, and you, you choose to start following God, but then you mess up the following week at your job? Think God just gives up on you? No, faith is built. But I can guarantee you, he's going to bring the same thing up to you again. And again. And again. Amen? Has he not done this? God is persistent. He doesn't just let things slip away. Why not? Sometimes we wish he would, right? Oh God, come on, just give me a break on this one. No, he has to be persistent because he loves you. And he wants you to have freedom. Sin is everything that is trying to destroy us. Our, our sinful mistake is thinking that our sins sometimes are things that are good for us. God changes our mind and shows us the things that are destroying us. And we want to hold on to him and hold on to him. But he helps us to remove that grip from him so that we can follow him. And what you will find as a result is joy unspeakable and full of glory. But it always takes time, effort, and energy to get there. It's not just an instant thing. He'll give you a picture of it at first when you're in here in the church house, but then when you're out there in the world, sometimes it's drudgery for a while. But then you start to get it. I'll close with a testimony. I had a group of friends when I became a believer, and I hung out with them, and I, and I believe I've told this story before, but it's no shame of me to tell it again. I used to tell dirty jokes. I used to tell, I, I had bad language, and even still, after I believed in Christ, I would still tell these jokes that I should not have told. And I hung out with this group of guys, and that's one thing we did. We would tell these jokes. We would say these things that were incredibly rude. And one of the guys, he was also, you know, sort of involved in ministry, and he tried to justify it. Nothing made me more frustrated than that. He said, come on, it's just the guys around. It's no big deal. But the Holy Spirit in my heart was telling me it is a big deal. But I didn't fix it right away. At first, I would tell the joke and then I would feel guilty about it. A little bit later down the line, a couple weeks, maybe a month or two, I would feel the guilt before I would tell the joke. But I would still tell it. A little bit later down the line, I would feel the guilt about what I was thinking. And then I stopped myself. But it took me a long time to get to the point that I was actually not saying them anymore. That wasn't an immediate thing. 
But God stuck with me and I stuck with God in it. And I knew that I wanted to stop doing that. And it took time for that to actually happen. But then God did something, you know, he went even above and beyond that. Then it was, why are you hanging out with people that are putting you in a position that you're even having those thoughts to tell those jokes? You're not going to tell those jokes if you're hanging out with people at church. They're not going to think of that stuff. You guys tempted to, you know, say a lot of stuff you shouldn't when you're at church? Probably not. So I started surrounding myself with different people and then it was a lot easier not to say that kind of stuff. That's the process of sanctification. Don't expect to have all your problems fixed right away. Just continue in the faith and continue with God and watch as he cleans you up. It's going to be ongoing, but he's going to do the work. I'm living proof of that and he's still sanctifying me. Guys, we're newlyweds, okay? The first time, you know, when you first go into marriage, you, you say some dumb things at times. I won't testify to all those right now. Give me a few years before, you know, when, when the uh, pain of some of that is gone from just dumb things that I've said mostly. Uh, but we're learning. And we find that when we have difficulty and we go through it, we get stronger and stronger and stronger. Kelsey has mentioned, I'm, I'm doing better at not mentioning her too much, but... Here, I'm slipping up on that. She's mentioned that she says we feel, we're feeling more and more like a couple now. She's like, probably because we've been fighting about some stuff. It's not bad stuff. We've just been, we've been willing to because, guys, I said in closing, I'm sorry. I'm working on that, okay? When you're newlyweds in that newlywed stage, the easier thing is, okay, this person is doing something that is not okay and it's bothering me, but I'm just going to avoid it. I'm just going to ignore it. When you're a newlywed, it's way easier to do that, right? You start to enter reality and you start to work through those things and then we get to the point that like, hey, yeah, I can communicate communicate with you about stuff when stuff isn't going right and I'm not worried that we're just going to hurt each other and, you know, do some foolish, but we're going to figure it out. And there's this beautiful confidence and peace that has come in from that and we're growing and growing and growing and hopefully that that is the case with all your marriages and continues to be that case. But that's to the point that I'm not afraid to tell you that we have arguments at times because it's like, because we get through them. And we get through them the right way without, you know, really hurting each other or anything like that. We, iron sharpens iron. So just be willing to stick with it and persevere in the faith and watch what God does. Let's, let's have a word of prayer briefly and then I want you to respond to this. Dear God, please give us patience. Please give us perseverance. Please give us persistence, oh God, in this that we might not run away at signs of trouble when you are trying to do something good in our lives. Please, Lord, help us to stick with it. For, Lord, the reward that is in the sufferings that we face now cannot compare to the glory that is to come. I ask in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't want to have you guys come up here for this because, well, frankly, I think that all of us would actually need to respond to this and you know i don't want there's not room for all of us to come stand up here but i want you to just respond where you're at to this resolve it in your heart today there's called the set before the set where jesus before he went to the cross what did he do he went to the garden Before Jesus went to the cross, he went to the garden and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he set his mind on this. There's another place when he was traveling to Jerusalem, it said he set his face like flint and went to Jerusalem. Church, you're going to have to resolve your mind to this. Individually, you're going to have to resolve yourself to this that when trials come up, I am going to consider it pure joy. And if I don't consider it pure joy, I'm going to repent of that and I'm going to consider it pure joy. Don't let yourself off the hook. If you start complaining, whining, something like that, don't make someone else call you out on it. Rebuke yourself and say, no, this is a trial. Yes, it's tough. Yes, it's difficult. But I'm going to consider it joy because of what it can do in me and through me. You have to make that decision. One thing no one else can control for you is your attitude, but you have control over what your attitude is going to be when you're in a given situation. So we're going to pray one more time, and I want you guys to be responsive in this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but, but if this is your prayer, say this with me. Repeat it after me in your head. What, however you want to do it, just reconcile it with God. Make it right with God right now. Like this, we're praying. We say, God... Teach me to consider my trials pure joy. 
Let me not run away from difficulty, but help me to go through difficulty for your sake, that you might be glorified through my life. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.